Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the last, let's say, intellectual part of today's program. I would like to start with a comment that, of course, uh, we are between what has been said today so far and the reception. So it is everybody's interest that, that we keep the time. And I have also a good news and a bad news. The good news is that we are not going to talk about the Russo-Ukrainian war. The bad news is that we have other problems <laughs> of global magnitude and we are going to talk about those. My name is Janusz Bogardi. I am a multi-life person. I have been with Andra Solutionary a couple of years in UNESCO. Uh, I am at present a senior uh, scientific advisor of IASC and also a, a senior fellow of the Institute of Development Research Center of the University of Bonn in Germany, which is focusing on the 85 percent and their livelihoods all around the world. Uh, today's session, this is not shown here, but okay is uh, one of the first panel, which is ecology and ecologies, local communities and responsibilities, um, something completely different as you uh, expected. This session will start with a few uh, attempts from my side to bring this ecology and ecologies, local communities and responsibilities together with this very overwhelming title of the whole Winter School Resilience in the Age of Uncertainty. How do, do the two fit together? Uh, I will have four PowerPoints and then I will invite the four panelists. I, in order to save the time, I would refrain from introducing them with their CVs because these are very nicely put together in the program so you can read it and uh, they are also kindly invited if they want to say one or two words about their uh, position or, or beliefs or, or what they want to say beyond what they are presenting, they are most welcome to do so. Um, so let us start with uh, trying to build a bridge between resilience in the age of uncertainty. It would be nice if it would work. Okay. Okay. Uh, what is... Uh, sorry. The four questions I want to very briefly touch upon is what does the age of uncertainty imply for ecology and especially if we talk in plural about ecologics, what do global communities and responsibilities mean when we just discussed that even a European problem is not a world problem or a world problem could be a, both a European one. Uh, if the notion of culture changes, what would mean for education? Do we teach the next generation to the same knowledge and skills they would need to solve the problems? And in the notion of terms of change, uh, what does the word resilience stands for? And I'm happy that I can skip this last one because in the very morning, uh, Professor Rithey already touched upon it. It means a lot, but uh, it, is, it is not the whole story. And we have to be very careful not to repeat words like sustainability, resilience, ecology, adaptation, uh, climate change. And at the very end, uh, we just repeat the words without offering the solution or even without offering the question for which uh, our mother institute stands, I ask. This is a very iconic name of the Kölseg Institute. A few questions I will probably won't project and please uh, try to get my PowerPoints because these questions are quite imminent for what we discussed so far. If you go to uh, whatever definitions, ecology is a branch of biology that deals with the relations of organisms to one another and in physical surrounding. Now, in the face of new ecology, with its increasingly technological, uh, these ecologies became more physical, more technological, and basically completely unknown to us. We are not fully aware what type of ecologies, what type of sets we are going to deal with each other, what are the new technologies means for finding the solutions, but also dealing with them. 
And it's most likely that we are going to have even more ecologies than what we experienced so far. And what these relatively rapidly changing ecologies mean, that we will be very unprepared uh, uh, to deal with them, to act within them, and our vulnerabilities, as I tried to uh, uh, highlight in the press talk this morning, uh, the vulnerabilities we are unaware of are undermining our abilities to respond. And I brought this example of the uh, earthquake in Turkey and in Syria, where you see almost all the houses destroyed and a few remained. Those were the houses which were built by the uh, earthquake standards, which withstood the earthquake. All others are uh, the manifestation of the vulnerability of this built infrastructure. OK, the next would be global. It means global and local. It means that we are all human beings acting at family scale, community scale, regional scale, national scale, continental scale, global scale, back and forth. And all these different levels interact with each other. So whatever we do in what level, it may have implication to the other one. And it was a good example showing the five Russia when they say that we deal only with the Kremlin Russia with the highest level. And it overshadows all the others, all the values of Russia, uh, which we all would like to keep. Uh, in my career at UNESCO, I spent almost two years working in Russia, and it's a fantastic country. Without Putin, it would be even better. Uh, OK, and it also emphasizes that whatever we do, it's embedded in a society. And, and uh, this globalization is probably is over. But we do not know yet. And if it is not over, as uh, or, uh, the director general indicates, yes. what new features this globalization will have? OK, culture. Uh, again, many definitions, the ideas and customs and social behavior of particular society. And we are having several cultures. It is very difficult to ask, do we have a global culture? Do we have the culture of peace? when the 85% of the world population say, hey, we, we, we have danced for the Western music for 100 years, now it is time to have a different uh, paradigm or a different model. And it is completely uh, uh, justified. Many uh, economists said that the 20th century was the anomaly because till 1860 Asia was the leading powerhouse of the world, which is going to become again uh, in this century. Uh, and this Western culture is diminishing its primacy, and I do not dare to uh, imagine that what the Western political leaders may act, like Putin, who saw the declining Russian de dominance and created what happened. I promise not to talk about the war. Okay, we may not realize yet, but education would be the next building station where we really have to change education, both in content and in, <coughs> in, in technology, how we communicate ever-increasing knowledge and to bring to young people these ever-complicated systems uh, that they can deal with it. Now, I'm having tried to bring the theme of the winter school and our panel Together, it is my pleasure to invite Zita Shebeshwari, who is uh, the Deputy Director of United Nations University Institute of Environment and Human Security. Uh, beyond her many uh, positive features, uh, she was hired by me a couple of years ago when I was the Director of UNUEHS, and I'm very happy that uh, she is now among the leaders of this institute. Zita. Itt nincs kép a... Meg kell nyomni a gombot. Melyiket? Melyiket? Jobb lent, jobbra lent. Jobb oldal, a szép kezed fele lent. Ja. Oké. So thank you very much for the very nice introduction. And uh, yes, uh, so the Institute's founding director is uh, Janusz Bogardi, and the Institute stands actually for looking into 
disasters, uh, disaster risk reduction, and um, evolving it and also in, into climate change adaptation and transformation uh, processes. UNU, as a part of the UN system, does have a global mandate, uh, particularly for developing countries, for developing nations, and uh, to, to uh, try to find solutions uh, which can uh, um, uh, actually uh, uh, help in, in that context. So I was looking into the uh, title of this uh, panel and also the description of the, uh, of the panel. Uh, I, I like the local. Uh, it was a word I never heard before, but I, I thought it's actually a good one to explore. And part of my uh, presentation will uh, deal with the local and what does it mean actually. Uh, also touching upon um, the UNFCCC uh, discussions around loss and damage and uh, the global goal and adaptation and what these global respons responsibility actually means. So when I looked at the uh, panel topic description, uh, the blue words are the, those which kind of ring, ring the bell and where I want to connect uh, with my um, presentation. Natural disasters, holistic solutions, interlinked challenges, global and local responsibilities. And please allow me to, to start with a cry out. So disasters are really not natural, and there are no natural catastrophes. There are natural hazards, uh, which then uh, uh, meet conditions of vulnerability, lack of capacities, uh, and uh, also exposure. So those are the combinations which actually lead up to a disaster. This means, means also that we do have agency uh, we as individuals, but also as a global community, we do have agency how to, how, how to deal with disasters. And that's already mentioned by uh, Professor Bogardi, so just uh, the recent examples what happened uh, in Turkey, but also if we are looking into Syria, I, I think we have a participant from, from uh, Syria. So what we see there is, yes, there was an earthquake, but the ultimate outcome is very much uh, co-shaped by uh, the abilities of the state to react and uh, to govern and to prevent uh, disasters and uh, to, to deal with the disaster during the disasters happening and in the aftermath, also in the, in the recovery process. And um, if we are reflecting back of last year, where we ha have seen a lot of uh, disasters uh, around the world, just uh, thinking about the terrible floods in, in Pakistan, um, this is uh, where actually the global uh, climate change uh, interact with local vulnerabilities, um, lack of capacities, and uh, which, which also led to all this uh, um, enforcement of uh, calling for loss and damage uh, debates uh, in the course of uh, the last uh, COP, uh, led by Pakistan, uh, which uh, was the um, presidency, or the presidency of the G77, and uh, really putting forward the loss and damage agenda in the course of um, uh, the COP. So if you are talking about disasters and about uh, what's happening globally, so just the insured losses, which is just a so small part of what is happening worldwide, have been um, around uh, 120 billion USD in the last year, just the insured losses. And um, what we are seeing uh, in terms of disaster, this is then um, exacerbated by the cascading impacts, by the compounding uh, um, disasters. So just to pick out some of these nine listed here, like broken supply chains or um, losses in productivity and losses in, uh, in, yeah, in life, but also in, in life quality. Um, burden on health and, and resilience. And if you are looking into the last year, we see all the disasters happening and compounding still uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic, but also the consequences, uh, ripple effect of the, of the war in the Ukraine. So the year of compounding and cascading uh, risk, uh, this is a report from, from Relief Ed for uh, for uh, Asia, so it's basically uh, seen around the globe, and this is something we need to deal with, interconnectivity, complexity, so we just need to invest much more uh, um, time and power into understanding and uh, designing uh, responses which are um, not kind of, not going into the um, luring uh, options to, to design easy solutions, because there are no easy solutions. 
So one of the uh, key messages of the uh, IPCC sixth assessment report one, was that these compounding risks are really the ones which are um, coming up, which we need to deal with. And one of those which uh, we see uh, strong effects is um, the compounding uh, risk of heat and drought. Um, but climate change also combines with habitat destruction, um, unsustainable resource use, and I think uh, the next speaker will uh, talk a bit into that direction, growing urbanization and issues of inequity, global inequity, but also uh, inequity uh, locally, which plays out very strongly when it comes to the impact of a disaster. So there's one example I am bringing from, from Nigeria. I think there was a participant, Rafael, are you here? from Nigeria, but the example could be from anywhere around the world. So it's, uh, the, the example is, is picked because it's, um, it shows uh, clearly this compounding effect, but it's happening everywhere. It's happening also here, it's happening in Germany, it's ha happening everywhere. So what we are seeing here is uh, Lagos, uh, a city um, at the coastline of um, Nigeria, which is suffering from frequent floods. And the floods does have different reasons. So you have a lot of uh, torrent rain events, which uh, co uh, comes together with, um, with insufficient uh, wastewater and, and uh, um, uh, sewage uh, uh, system, so that there is a lot of flooding within the city. But at the same time, um, there's also a lot of uh, resource extraction around the coastline. Uh, sand is mined, um, usually as an illegal activity because it's actually forbidden, uh, but a lot of sand is removed from the coastline so that the coast is eroding, um, degrading the natural protection systems against uh, um, sea uh, level rise and the storm surges, uh, what the coastline already now is seeing. Uh, so basically the flooding which comes from the rainfall uh, combines with flooding uh, from the sea and the outlook for the future is uh, quite uh, bleak uh, for the city. So when we are talking about uh, different kind of compounding risk, we try uh, to, to tell the stories of what is actually going on in a region, that it's actually a complex a compounding risk and that there are no easy solutions. So we do have the floods, we have uh, um, sinking um, uh, of the, of the um, uh, coastline, uh, we have uh, a lot of urbanization and growing uh, city, and that combines together with this resource extraction. Uh, many people doesn't know, but sand is actually one of the resources which is uh, uh, getting uh, more and more scarce. Many think that, oh, there are a lot of deserts, uh, but that sand is actually not uh, suitable for construction work. So uh, the sand which is suitable for construction, constructing houses, um, roads, uh, and so on, that's a, a particular uh, quality sand which you can mine from rivers or the coastline, and that is actually getting uh, scarce. And where we actually still mine it, um, oftentimes leads to coastal erosion, or riverbank erosion, exacerbating other type of risks. And this is just one of the materials which is getting scarce on um, a time horizon which we actually can see already. And I am referring back again to the next speaker. So when we are talking about or looking at these uh, issues with a climate change lens, then we need to um, acknowledge that many people are in vulnerable situations and uh, adaptation progress is so far, far from being uh, sufficient. So not enough is invested, not enough is known about ad adaptation and the gap between what needs to be done and what is happening is getting um, larger and larger. Um, we try to communicate um, with different means um, so we, we have a science-based report which uh, uh, comes with technical reports, but then um, we are working together with designers, we are working together with, uh, with writers uh, to, to try to tell the stories, stories in a different way that they can be better understood and, and taken up. And if you would like to see some other examples, um, you may visit uh, this interconnected risk site. 
But coming back for this global and, and local, if you are a bit familiar with climate change adaptation and the research around it, there are some uh, so-called heuristics. So, so some things which are widely accepted and which you will find in all the reports or, or the scientific papers. And I really call out that some of these would need to be revisited critically. And one of those is that adaptation is a local issue. You will find this uh, widespread. And uh, it basically says that um, adaptation is very specific to the local conditions. And because of this, it should be locally led and locally governed and done locally, so to say, uh, which is true. Um, but the conditions um, which are shaping the space for adaptation are not local. They are regional or national or even global. And this is where I would like to connect to the, to the current debate about the so-called global goal and adaptation, which is actually uh, within the uh, Paris Agreement, so 2015. The part of the Paris Agreement, which has not prog progressed since, since then, uh, where in Glasgow there was a commitment to look into the global goal of adaptation, and where uh, workshops and negotiations are happening just right now and the, in the course of the last year and, and next year. And it's not yet clear where we are going with the global goal of adaptation, but I think, I think that it should be something which is aspirational, which shows us the way um, what adaptation should mean uh, in terms of justice, what adaptation should mean in terms of global responsibility, and do not leave it just be a local responsibility. And then finally, and this is my last slide, um, in many cases, uh, it's not enough anymore to, to change the system in an incremental way, to fix it a little bit here, fix it a little bit there, but we need to rethink the way how we use this planet, uh, because we simply do not have the time and do not have the resources just to continue and, and hope that uh, technological uh, solutions will, will us help out. And if it comes to uh, the scale of the change and, and the way how the change could be achieved, we really need to again think together the global and the local because change is happening on both ways. They can come from the grassroots and this can reach, so to say, the, the, the dominant regime, but uh, it uh, can come also uh, from megatrends and such as the megatrends was the pandemic and probably also the war. Um, and, and we need to see that, so to say, working together um, for our good, uh, for, for trying to bring, so to say, um, us to a better pathway, which actually allows humanity to survive, I must say. And I think that's a, a good handover. Um, uh, the take home messages, if, if you just remember one thing, Disasters are not natural. We have an agency, humanity has got an agency. They are increasingly interlinked, they compound, and there are no easy fixes. So whoever promised you an easy fix, um, look critically, because there are no easy fixes. We have to really uh, embrace this complexity because uh, otherwise um, uh, we were just uh, up for a maladaptive action which uh, will turn out to be um, uh, dead end as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zita. And uh, I do not need to introduce our next speaker, Professor Gerencher, who is rector of the pa University Pannonia. And András already said some of uh, the, uh, the reference to your recent papers where you were heavily uh, acting as a uh, bell. Uh, how, how, huh? Yeah, so, so you were ringing the bell that uh, we are close to the end of what we di did so far. Okay. Sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I also prepared four slides only, so I will be shorter than uh, expected. And uh, I will start right uh, from the middle. I, this is how, how global problems uh, may be solved. There, there is actually two two ways of solving global problem. Problem is up there, here. And then uh, we have to acquire knowledge on the problem, so science uh, must do their 
its job to get a, a grip of the of the problem and then uh, based on the knowledge that we we collected we have to find some solution and the upper part of this uh, this uh, slide uh, represents real world real world is very narrow because it is constrained by physical and uh, natural laws and it uh, it's very constrained you cannot do anything or can it, you cannot do too many things in the real world because because you are you are constrained by the law of of nature but uh, to uh, these days and uh, i m i mentioned it in uh, in my uh, opening speech in the morning that uh, since the birth of the internet and the spread of the internet there uh, there has been an alternative truth emerging it's uh, used also by politics but used by other people as well and it can also be called virtual reality and virtual reality is much broader than uh, than real world because you can do anything in virtual reality uh, but you cannot do it in real world and and then uh, 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 in order to solve some of the problem the problem itself is too complex to be solved uh, by uh, politicians they do not even understand the, the problem itself so they need to uh, deliver some uh, very simple message from the problem uh, derive uh, some uh, message this i call one bit message uh, all problems need to be simplified to a one bit message otherwise it cannot be tackled by politicians and by the public uh, and add some uh, economic interest uh, mo mostly the interest of big uh, multinational companies and then comes out some uh, virtual solution, which is not the solution of the problem, but the solution that seems to be a, a real-world solution, but it isn't. And uh, the color is uh, uh, indicating that there is, you can imagine that, okay, this is uh, the water here, the blue one is water, and the above water is reality. The water is very deep, you can do whatever you want uh, in the water, but you find solutions which is brown, just a symbol of something which comes to the surface as a new problem. I wouldn't uh, go into details of that, but <laughs> so that's a problem, a solution which is actually not a solution, but something, a start of a new problem then has to be tackled. And I will show examples of both ways. First, uh, the good way, which happens in the real world. And that was, uh, Actually, okay, this one, okay. So this was a success story of humanity. This is how we, we tackled global ozone. Um, here I showed some of the milestones of, uh, of, this, uh, uh, of this issue. Starting from science, there were some uh, scientific achievements. Actually, they were worth, worth of Nobel Prize. So all these guys uh, won a Nobel Prize except Lovelock. Uh, for uh, the discovery of, of uh, ozone chemistry. And then almost uh, only a decade after uh, came politicians and, and uh, they had a, a treaty or they reached uh, agreement upon how to fix ozone, global ozone. So it's uh, seemingly it's a success story, but there is uh, Vienna Convention. Have any of you heard of Vienna Convention on Ozone? No, you, you have heard of Montreal Protocol? Yeah, all of you? Yeah. Montreal Protocol on Ozone, but not on Vienna Convention. Vienna Convention was first. It was nothing. It was just, okay, we have to research, we have to get more information, like in climate, climate uh, treaties. We have to uh, do more research, cooperate, something, L just bullshit. <coughs> and that was first. But at the same year when this uh, Vienna uh, Convention was signed, came uh, out of the blue the ozone hole above the Ar Antarctic. And then uh, the people were, all politicians were uh, frightened and they very quickly put together uh, a real um, meaningful protocol which uh, then was uh, observed and then then the ozone problem was uh, solved and the ozone layer is now recovering. So it was a solution from the real world, originally not intended to do so, but 
but nature helped and then frightened us enough to, to make real uh, change and to solve the problem very quickly, within, within a decade from the first uh, scientific discovery. So it was a very record uh, uh, fast, uh, fast solution to the problem. So this happened in the real world, actually. Uh, and, and what about climate change? Climate change is actually, the problem of climate change is older than the ozone problem. So it started, it dates back to the 19th century when, uh, when this uh, uh, connection was first uh, recognized by the Swedish chemist Ar Arrhenius. But then, uh, in the middle of, uh, or the end of the uh, 50s, uh, this global CO2 monitoring started and, and uh, there were, uh, science were quite uh, um, ready to, to uh, state that this is a real problem. And then came politi politics, uh, and actually the first conference on global climate in Geneva was earlier than the ozone convention, even in Vienna. So it, it, uh, it came earlier. And then it contained this message, the one bit message is CO2 temperature. Came the global warming, this is a very simple message. And this is, this seems obvious from the, from, uh, the comparison of the trends of both uh, CO2 concentration and uh, temperature, because the two goes together, so there is a casual relation between the two. So if, in order to fix the global climate, you have to, do something with CO2, and that's so. So this is a simple message, which is uh, the, uh, which is not true, of course, because the climate is a much more complex system than than uh, it um, it seems. So it is a very complex system, but it it's a very simple message that came. And then came the solution in the alternative world. It's the simple solution is just eliminate CO2, and then you have all the climate change fixed. So this is uh, how it looks like, or uh, it's uh, international politics. So the ma magic uh, buzzword is decarbonization. This is, this is uh, the magic bullet. It solves everything. So if we change uh, from fossil fuel to renewables, then we are fine and we can do whatever we want and we can continue economic growth unlimited uh, infinitely, so it's, this is the message that it conveys. And like in the tales, in the fairy tales, so there is a bad guy, is the fossil, is the oil, it's bad, and the hero is the renewable, which uh, kills the fossil and then saves the world, like Captain America or whatever, Captain Planet. So it's a, it's a kind of... Uh, a uh, fairy tale, and it, it sounds very nice, but it's not true. But the main reason for selecting this option for solving the climate change, instead of looking at the problem in, in, uh, in, uh, more deeply, is actually that there are two options to combat climate change. One is to reduce consumption, to, to, be, to keep or, or life uh, uh, within the boundaries of the earth, not using uh, resources, not uh, wasting resources, but to keep uh, within the boundaries. This, this was represented by the Club of, uh, 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 Club of Rome uh, report from the 70s, so the limits to growth, uh, that the uh, earth is fin finite and we, there is no uh, way to, to grow indefinitely. But this would decrease GDP. So it's not a solution at all, because then politicians will, will not be elected again and, uh, and uh, share, shareholders would not receive uh, money at, at the end. So that's, uh, that's not an option to, to select this, uh, this uh, way of uh, solving environmental problems. But if we select this one, the second one, which is the mainstream actually, then we increase GDP. We have to replace the whole infrastructure. We have to, to just throw out uh, these uh, old fossil stuff and, and uh, get new one. This is a very good uh, business, very good business. Pay, uh, with high uh, profit, it's a, actually giga profit, will be earned if we do this. But the problem is that we would not have resources to do that. 
but this is because this is in the real world. This solution is in the alternative reality or alternative uh, virtual rea reality or alternative truth. It will run into the limits of resources very soon. So that's not, but that's the mainstream. So unfortunately, it's uh, it's taken up by uh, by global politics, and we are convinced that we are doing it right because we are living in, an, in the realm of alternative reality and we will save the world and save the climate and whatever, but in, instead we will run into uh, an, a collapse or an, an uh, economic crisis, a long-lasting crisis of modern civilization because we do not consider the other alternative which would be the only feasible a solution to any environmental problem if human uh, consumption is reduced uh, significantly. But that's not an option currently for uh, most of the politicians and most of the world. But with this, I think that we will run into problems within a couple of uh, decades when we run out of natural resources which are not available. And Unfortunately, money can be uh, can be uh, produced. I mean, uh, printed or whatever. But uh, energy, for example, or mineral resources cannot be printed. Not so. That will be a problem for humanity, and we have to be aware of that. Instead of uh, doing something in the alternate, in the realm of alternative truths. Okay. Thank you. And that was my two. Thank you very much. These were two examples or two dimensions of the problems we are facing. You could also say that all the problems are the three P problems, population, poverty, and pollution, because basically climate change is a thermal pollution of the atmosphere. Now, to have uh, at the end of this session two presentations which will be more methodological, the first one is uh, with uh, uh, Zofia uh, Illes, who will show us a, a more than multidisciplinary, uh, so scientific plus art, uh, art approach of how to design a, a future which is going beyond human desires and towards sustainability. Certainly, an attempt and probably not solving on global scale the problems we discussed all today, but at least a kind of uh, uh, silver horizon on, on that we are, uh, are thinking how to tackle, how to uh, design the future, which is, may grow out of uh, virtuality, but also, as we, say, we shall see, it is on a sens uh, sen sensory approach where you have to see and turn the earth, what you see, into reality. Okay, okay so it works. Uh, thank you for the introduction. I'm uh, Jofia Ilesh, and I feel I come from a quite different area, probably from most of you. I'm a placemaking designer and a researcher um, in land research project, uh, projects by the Moholina University of Design. I'm also a fellow researcher at IESC. Um, as I was introduced, I do research sensory methods into placemaking design, and I'll explain all these um, terms I have been using. What is design? Why design might be interesting in terms of ecological thinking and research? What is placemaking? Um, and what do, do our senses have to do with all of this and art and design? So I will break down all these and I'll be reading from my notes because I haven't had the chance to speak to a live audience in a while. Um, and let's see how it goes. So um, my contribution to the panel as, as I was introduced will be uh, a design and methodological one um, in order to explore what different kinds of arts and design-based methods can do in relation to global challenges such as climate change. 
uh, how these can encourage and enable place-based engagement and collaboration, and how such methods can help designers and researchers to communicate multifaceted complex environmental issues. So what does design do and what can design do in relation to how we interact with our environments? Uh, this is an example of how our behavior shapes the environment. I think I, I, uh, it's, it's my old slides, I'm sorry. I had a really nice slide about hostile architecture and uh, desire paths uh, that are not here apparently. But I wanted to share a picture about what desire paths are. So that's an example of how our behavior can shape the environment. Desire paths are uh, paths that normally people naturally take at a park and then designers look at it and they will actually choose those desired paths as uh, pedestrian walkways later on. So that's a way how we shape our environment. We choose what will, what will those paths be for us. Another way I wanted to share with you, but the slide is also missing, is uh, hostile architecture. So that's, uh, that's a bad example of uh, how humans can shape the environment and how the environment in um, reaction to that also shapes how we behave in, in there. So hostile architecture is when uh, urbanists, for example, place out in the urban um, uh, public areas uh, benches that might have spikes on it or trees where there are spikes or window sills with spikes so pigeons wouldn't sit on the win window sills or homeless people wouldn't use benches for sleeping. So that's an example of hostile architecture when the environment that we design will shape our behavior within the environment. Um, and um, so this here is, is what I wanted to talk about uh, to define what placemaking design does and what placemaking does. Um, as it's defined by Kelker and, and Spinelli, it's the interplay of needs and aspirations of the community enacted in the design of the environment. These are two images to illustrate this, two of my previous project examples, when diverse communities were involved in decision-making about land use, uh, urban land use uh, in the left, on the left side, and it was about uh, land, future land use in Scotland on the right side. On the left side, diverse communities were involved in London uh, to decide about how public green space it could support their mental health. And on the right hand side, children were participating in, in making and in helping shape uh, the future land use policies of, of Scotland. So placemaking, what placemaking does, it involves diverse communities. And as designers, we are trying to find those right tools for that kind of involvement. What tools would speak to the audiences that we want to involve? So essentially, this is participatory research and choosing the methods for that. And these methods essentially all stem from human-centered design. That has been the most predominant design perspective for the past 30 years at least, with disciplines stemming from it such as service design, interaction design, user experience research, all to encompass complex processes, services, and, and social systems. A good example of human-centered design is social design that places social issues at the center of the design process and involves those experiencing these in participatory process. On the left side, it's uh, an example from Hungary, Miskolc, Markraft Social Workshop, um, where they do work with uh, young people um, on the autism spectrum disorder, and on the right side, it's Phytology Medicine Garden and Mobile Apothecary from London, uh, where they actually, it's, it's basically a community herbal garden, and they support uh, people in need from the area with herbal medicine. So these are, for me, good examples of, of what social design can do. And then an example of what happens when design goes wrong 
uh, with humans in the center of it again um, and excludes certain publics is, is hostile design, as I mentioned before. So spiky benches to prevent uh, um, homeless people from sleeping there and uh, spiky trees that would prevent pigeons, for example, using the trees, their green infrastructure, basically. Not nice. Um, but where I wanted to get with all this is a provocation that I wish, wish to offer here. Um, we see that the start of human-centered design is dated back to around 1958 to the founding of the Stanford University Design Program. And various dates uh, for the Anthropocene Epoch have also been proposed. Recently, the 1960s is one theory, and this actually correlates with the start of human-centered design. We cannot argue that uh, human-induced changes got us here, so the provocation I'm offering from a design perspective is that we might need a paradigm shift to decenter the human in the design process. If the only tool you have is a hammer, you tend to see every problem as a nail, states the theory of law of instrument by Abraham Maslow. To decenter the human perspective, therefore, we will also need new methods and new tools that allow for understanding the versatility of diverse viewpoints, multiscalar and multi-layered complexities, and allow for considering different timescales rather than only the human one. And here my presentation connects with the original question of emerging ecologies. Yes. And I propose that participatory and sensory art and design methods could be alternative tools in empathizing with other perspectives and imagining future scenarios. This image is an example of a project that we did in this region of the Lake Balaton in um, Balaton Upland region during the autumn. Uh, sensory and artistic approaches were used here to help local farmers and stakeholders imagine the climate future of the region 10 years from now. I will talk more about this project later on. Such sensory methods that the previous project was also using are rooted in sensory ethnography. This perspective is interdisciplinary in that it also draws from theoretical approaches um, developed in human um, and cultural geography. And the principles of sensory ethnography include sensory perception, knowing, memory, and imagination. And imagination is an important one for us to imagine possible futures. This approach promises to bring to the fore tacit, normally unspoken about ways of knowing and doing that are also part of how we feel and sense our futures. This image above is a sensory map uh, from a placemaking project that I did with a migrant woman in Glasgow, in one of the most diverse neighborhoods of Glasgow in, in Govan Hill in 2020, um, where there is the highest concentration of vacant and derelict land affecting communities living around that area um, and stigmatizing people living in that neighborhood. So this map was one of the results of a set of uh, participatory mapping walks to help understand how these spaces affected the well-being of uh, migrant women living in the area. And it was a set of workshops and a set of walks uh, concluding with the last one that was um, to imagine possible future scenarios, future imagining, basically. The same approaches can also be well used in imagining ecological futures. They can help participants and stakeholders to empathize with more than human perspectives or imagine future scenarios. Um, or make sense of phenomena that may otherwise easily escape the human sensorium, like the Anthropocene, or the climate crisis that is um, very difficult to understand. Processes happening on different timescales on a global level. 
and they might easily escape the human sensorium, so it's not the easiest for us to make sense of such phenomena. Attending to the sensory experience can give us access to other scales and temporalities that we humans cannot otherwise easily comprehend. Where the process is involved, the long duration of geological time easily escapes the human sensorium. By bringing these phenomena somehow into our human experience through sensing, it can also help us better relate. So that instead of such removed visual representations um, that are quite removed from our immediate reality, our visual references might also change, perhaps become something more close to our daily experience. I brought uh, one example for this. Um, this is the Balaton Uplands project I previously mentioned, an artistic design research project done with the MoMA University in collaboration with ecologist uh, Ferenc Jordan, farmers and our students from MoMA to explore the near future uh, landscape and the ecology of the Balaton Uplands 10 years from now in order to help the pre-adaptation of farmers working in this region. Through scientific data and based on interviews with local farmers, we have developed the landscape network model of this area 10 years from now. So the current one is on the left and the future one is on the right. That included species that are already appearing and with the changing climate in the changing landscape, such as uh, pomegranates, olives, uh, pistachios. I know this sounds crazy, but it's actually already in the landscape. Um, with our students, we created a future landscape through food, sound, and video. And our stakeholders and participants were invited into this sensory future landscape to think together, argue, and discuss what they have found realistic and how they might try to adapt. I will end my contribution to the panel by concluding that experiential art and design methods can be well used in participatory projects and research to enable diverse engagement and collaboration. They can be good tools of scientific knowledge transfer by communicating complexities and new insights. And sensory methods can help imagine alternative and possible future scenarios and provide alternative perspectives. These methods will be further discussed and explained through more examples uh, during the Wednesday morning seminar. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. While listening to you, I imagine diplomats uh, to play with uh, flowers and branches, <laughs> designing the future world order. And I, I hope that it would happen. So the last uh, speaker of this panel is Sanya Tepanchevic, who is, uh, uh, according to her CV, an expert in Russian foreign policy. Uh, but irrespective of that, I believe the presentation scope will be more general <coughs> and more future-oriented. Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the introduction, and uh, I'm a political scientist by uh, training, by my PhD, but I'm sociologist or even social anthropologist by heart. <laughs> so, uh, but here I will not say even a word about Russia, I promise, and about Ukraine as well. I will talk about a uh, search for ecologically sustainable economy, sorry for the word sustainable, um, and... Um, what I also think is important to mention, and that it is also in the uh, essence of our today's uh, discussions, whatever they are about, are the institutions. And uh, I would like to start from asking you one simple question, like from the very beginning, simple question. If you traveled recently around Europe, around the European Union, to be more precise, can you recall uh, where did you see the least disturbed nature? Who said something? Transylvania. Scotland. Transylvania. Okay. This is a please. Salisbury Plain. 
Salzburg. The largest area of unspoiled natural grassland left in Europe. Because it's a military training area. <laughs> that is all very important to mention. Non-EU country? Can you consider not European country? Yes, you can bring it in. My country is well in Georgia. Georgia. That's one of the most beautiful countries ever <laughs> in the world. And I promised... Please. Of course. Thank you for that. <laughs> I would mention Slovenia first. Okay, I also hope. <laughs> so thank you. Um, when I traveled the European Union, I could notice, for example, and like being trained as political scientist and paying a lot of uh, attention to the institutions, not only political institutions, but economic as well. I um, so like really differences especially within the continent within the continent continental europe uh, between let's say central and eastern europe and uh, really central europe and southern europe and western europe and this has to deal with some kind of economic models and i will uh, bring it here, the relationship between the economy and the environment. So the global financial crisis, which started in 2008 and had a really long outcomes and uh, results that we are still uh, feeling, is uh, some kind of, in the newer human history, some kind of a turning point. And uh, it also increased the interest in the economy, the relationship between economy and environment. And uh, we also know that there were several proposals. Some of them were called Green New Deal, uh, Green Stimulus, or Green Economy. But they all uh, somehow, in one or another way, refer to green capitalism. Because we live in the system that is really called capitalism, and it is present everywhere, whether uh, perceived in its nicer way, uh, like market economy or not, but it is capitalism globally. And um, these proposals were putting forward different models of greenness, so the recognition that there are varieties of green capitalism, and this was being mooted and increases in opportunities for more targeted uh, critiques of each of the model. Uh, so let me then go to the models, like uh, known models of the market economies. So these are all called varieties of capitalism. Maybe many of you heard about it. This was put forward uh, first in 2001 by Hall and Soskitz. I don't know why is this moving forward. And uh, two initial models of the economy were uh, taken from the institutional models of the UK and the US, which was called the liberal market economies. And the other one, uh, which was the opposite, is the coordinated market economy, where which we can see, first of all, in Germany, but also in the continental Europe. And uh, there are also... Um, research, forward research, um, also demonstrated that there are also other varieties. And within the um, continental Europe and in the southern Europe, there were found also two other that are somehow in the middle of, the, uh, of these two opposite models. So one of them is the mixed or Mediterranean market economy that we can see in Italy, Spain, and France. And here you can uh, read uh, what are their um, major characteristics. And another one that is seen and found here, especially among the Visegrad four countries, is dependent market economy model, dependent on foreign direct investments. And this is very important as well. I will just mention a major kind of characteristics of the liberal market economies and the uh, coordinated market economies. So as you can see here, 
uh, in liberal market economies, competition is the most important um, character, characterization, and it prevails both in labor, financial markets, they are all deregulated, so basically, if we recall uh, Adam Smith and Invisible Hand, that is bottom line of the liberal market economy. In the coordinated market economy, this is exactly the opposite. What is the most important feature is the coordination. So it's not just cooperation or collaboration. It is really coordination of different um, groups within the society, coordination of their interests, and uh, in the end, what we have, what, what this type of the market economy is mostly characterized by is the more equality, more social equality, while liberal market economy represents much unequal societies. And uh, my task for today was to see what, which of them, or these models in between, are more um, sustainable. So we have here varieties of capitalism, and now uh, I also try to find varieties of ecologies. So I found, as you can see, a lot of them. And uh, this is to address uh, one of the questions that are posed for this panel today and uh, for this uh, school. Um, the winter school is like, do we have one ecology or we have many different ecologies? As you can see here, we can start from the microbial ecology that looks at the smallest like versions of life. Then we have organism, so this is the study of the organism at its fundamental level and can encompass microbial ecology. Then the, sec the, the next stage is population ecology, so that the next rank uh, that looks at the ecology of the certain population of the certain group. Then we have community, which takes all these groups or these populations together and look at them. And then ecosystem, and then the global ecology that I believe we talk about here today and uh, these five days. Also human ecology. And the last one that is also extremely important is the niche construction, because it is an example of ecology that uh, deals with the study of how organisms are able to alter their environment for their benefit and also for the benefit of other living things. And my question is whether we as humans are able to do that, I'm to, to leave space for other, other species. Um, so I was wondering really how do varieties of capitalism correlate or do not correlate with the varieties of ecologies. And uh, I found several really interesting uh, studies. So the one is, uh, the one says that, um, and puts forward this interesting concept of corporate environmental responsibility, because we know that uh, despite uh, the fact that states are trying to keep some kind of control that we talked about today, um, we see that there are multinational corporations that are basically one of the main uh, actors in uh, globalization. And this logic of economic globalization suggests that mul multinational corporations operating in countries of comparable economic development and uh, social cultural values uh, have orientation that would pursue similar corporate environmental responsibility. However, oh, to another. In reality, uh, MNC's efforts to reduce and report on their ecological footprint exhibit remarkable qualitative and quantitative differences, and the cross-national nat institutional differences are central. And they're also, they have been neglected factor in explaining this relationship and what is the result uh, that Mayer explained even back in 2011 is that firm, firms disclose, these multinational corporations disclose more and better information 
on their corporate environmental responsibility efforts in less coordinated market economies than in more coordinated market economies, which is also, uh, in a way, it is it is logical because it is deregulated market. These are the deregulated models. However, some other studies, and this is also uh, interesting uh, concept, clean development mechanism, demonstrated that were done, uh, there is a book um, uh, published in 2015 uh, that uh, dealt with uh, the, the exploration of the characteristics uh, of global economy from the point of view of, of emerging market economies. So these are mostly Asian economies. Um, and uh, many states that have experienced a rapid economic growth, uh, so basically over the uh, 30 years, not only 20, it's um, that there's increasing share of global wealth that uh, was mentioned today as well. And uh, they gain importance in this global economy because uh, they have grown across a wide range of policy domains. And one relevant example is the increasingly critical role in addressing climate change. So, contrary to the popular belief that the level of development determines a country's ability to produce positive en environmental outcomes, and this was the uh, example maybe of Georgia as well, or maybe even Transylvania, is that Benny they shows that the variation in environmental outcomes among the emerging market economies is due to differences in types of economic institutions that are prevalent. And the major result was that although liberal market economies were expected to perform better than other types of capitalism, it seems that, on the contrary, economic institutions related to coordinated types of the capitalisms, among others found in China and Brazil, have led to greater clean development mechanism and uh, market participation. So coordination is important in uh, developing uh, without natural disaster. Uh, and I also found the interesting examples uh, in Europe. So I'm not now talking about uh, the effect of <laughs> renewables, but uh, rather about the renewable energy policies uh, within the um, European Union. And uh, back in 2015, 2016, while the European Union was also so when the UK was part of the European Union, and there were also these two general models, so liberal market economy represented by the UK, and the coordinated market economy represented by Germany. So um, Chetkovic and Buzogani, uh, they found that, um, in fact, uh, there is a tendency within the European Union towards coordinated uh, policies uh, within the European Union regarding the re like introduction of renewables. So, so far, um, they see that, well, it was how many, like, well, seven years ago, uh, that there is a potential uh, to coordinate these uh, policies among the EU member states, though you mentioned today that there are many disappointing things, but this was one of uh, like positive examples. And um, my kind of uh, conclusion for this, um, based on this small research and my small contribution to today's panel and today's uh, discussion is that uh, structured economic coordination across the EU and also across the globe uh, may result in better protected environment, natural environment, than mutually coordinated economic growth instead of uh, degrowth.
So it's not... Uh, uh, I remember one of our discussions that uh, I asked maybe last year that we use very much uh, many negative uh, words, so degrowth is one of them, and I also thought what should be the kind of solution, so mu mutually coordinated economic growth. The one that looks not only about now and for me, and for my closest community, but to think about many other people, and then this can lead to bigger social equality. So basically, this is my small contribution. I think it was provocative enough. Very good, very <laughs> Thank good. you. Thank you very much. Thank you for to uh, showing a number of building stones, which could be some of them could fit together to build the future world we may be able to live in sustainably. I'm not against the word sustainability if the person who spells it out knows what she or he means by that. The problem is that many use the word without thinking what it may mean. Uh, this is my pleasure to uh, say goodbye and thank for the interest of those who followed the proceedings of this winter school on Facebook and YouTube.